Okay, so uh, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Instead of uh, lecture slides, we're just gonna go um, over these, these notes. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about content creation. Uh, so who, when was the, the last, what was the last piece of content that you created? So uh, everything that we produce can be, uh, can be like described as, as content, some type of content. We have stuff that we publish to just one person, like maybe our mom, or we have things that we publish to um, only our friend, specific friend group on Snapchat, or there's things that we publish to everyone that has internet, internet access, maybe like a blog or something. <clears throat> but there's one thing that, um, there's a, that, that's very common across all of these, and that's having strong uh, writing comprehension. And so writing well is part habit, part knowledge of some fundamental rules, and part not giving a damn. Or wait, yeah, and part giving a damn. So you have, it, has everyone heard that uh, moniker, uh, you have to know the rules before you can break them? So same thing with writing and what we do uh, is kind of an art form. There's, we teach you all these rules of design, these rules of writing, um, and once you understand them, feel free to break them, but we do want you to understand them to, to begin with and have a, a strong, uh, be able to wield them appropriately. So when we talk about an operation definition of, of what content is, um, an operational definition is something that is more tangible, something that we can uh, use and apply to what we're actually doing in the moment, where a theoretical definition might not have uh, uh, as many real world applications. So for this, this context, for what we're in right now, um, content is everything your customer or prospect comes into contact with. It's the whole user experience. So <clears throat> you're gonna notice this word like customer. Um, why, why are we considering people that would see our content a customer or a prospect? Why do we use that language? Why do we, why do we use that verbiage? Because one, they're probably following you or following your content. Um, <coughs> So why does it, well, what does the word customer entail? Like what, what are some of the implications attached to the word customer? That your content is the product you're selling. Ah, so they're seeking a product, they're seeking something, they found it within you and now they're engaging. They're consuming your content. What does it to mean, to, what does it mean to be a prospect? Is anyone taking sales, ag sales? What's a prospect? It's someone who a potential yeah, absolutely. Customer. Yeah, and so somebody who has bought in is a customer, somebody that hasn't bought in yet uh, can be a prospect. And so I, I'm glad that y'all aren't immediately thinking, oh, we have a service to sell. Um, this can definitely be the, a lifestyle that they want to, uh, to view, or it could just be something that they see value in that they want to consume. Um, so there's that quote, content is the entire user experience. So it's very broad. Everything like touches is content. So does everyone remember the Lion King? Mm -hmm. Right, that one has a lot of staying power. I don't feel so old. You what? text message, we had some captions, we had another text message, uh, or you had a video, right? So even though when it comes to the content, it's not always going to, uh, the, the main part of it's not always going to be writing, but why is writing so important when it comes to content creation? 
I feel like with writing, like that almost like makes or breaks the prose. Because like mm -hmm. you can have a good picture, you can have a good whatever, but like that's almost like whenever they figure out, like if you were a good brand or not. Because like if you have a really cool picture and like you have either no caption or something, it's like like then they might be like, okay, this may be not legit. Oh, so like maybe some credibility. Yes. Okay, Brittany. I was just gonna say like the caption is the only way that you're actually allowed to speak to the audience okay. without actually being able to block them. So you, you get to do a video. Well, yeah, but there's some. A lot there's of people don't watch the videos. Content. They know everything. They read the caption and then decide to watch the video. Well, yeah, but okay. there's also some content though that you don't want it to always be a video. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So I, I would say that when you have a good understanding of what writing is and what engaging writing, writing that is engaging is, that also means that you have probably a good foundation to create and capture videos or photos that tell a story as well. Something that can send out a message. And so I think that that's why um, in this, this under what is content, uh, the core of content is writing. Um, in some instances, it's literally the experience. So, you know, probably like what Brittany said, you know, that's how we can communicate and, and send that message. But things like blog posts, ebooks, and white paper, Twitter posts, website text really relies on written content. Other times, things like videos or slideshows start out with a script or an infographic. Um, so, especially when you're doing lectures, presentations, or a video, having that script or having that outline of what you want to deliver uh, does rely on a, a good foundation of writing. Words are a proxy, a stand-in for the things that we as people and we as companies want to convey to the world. Um, so we talk a lot, um, especially like in communication studies, uh, that words are really, really powerful and the words that we choose um, and the context that we place them in are really important because they are so powerful. Um, we can look at a lot of cultural norms um, or um, contemporary cultural issues where words uh, and the meanings that we place behind them can cause uh, a lot of pain or they can cause a lot of hope. And so I'm sure you can think in, in your own instances where uh, words have harmed or words have created um, opportunities for change. So it's important to always uh, pay attention to the words that you use. Um, even try to even take them out of context. Um, whenever we talk about message delivery, one of the, the examples that I always use or one of the devices that I would want people to use is type out your message and then read it in the worst possible way. Because if you write a message and you leave the door open for it to be misunderstood, chances are it will. So write so that there's no way that anyone could misunderstand what you're writing. So, uh, that was kind of off topic. Another thing to kind of begin to get you into this mindset of providing quality content creation is ask yourself, are you telling a story from a unique perspective? There is a lot of content out there and what you produce has the potential to get buried and lost within this storm of content, the storm of pictures, the storm of videos. There's a lot out there. So if you can provide a unique perspective to your, to your consumer, they will probably want to attach on to you and continue to follow you instead of going and moving on to someone else. Also need to think and evaluate the voice and the style in, in which you write and, and in the way that you create content. So what do we mean by voice and style? I feel like like Palace does a really good job. I don't mm -hmm. know if y'all follow Palace Coffee. Mm -hmm. They do a very good job of like having cons consistent voice and almost like mm -hmm. personality with all of their... It, it goes along with the brand of what you are. Yeah, like uh, you can tell that if if it is not the same person who's written all of the posts, mm -hmm. then 
someone sat down with them and told them this is what Talos Coffee is going for mm -hmm. because it is a it is a very specific style. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good example. When it comes to uh, your writing as well, whether it's blog posts or opinion articles or what you write for the brand, uh, your your last semester here. Developing a unique voice is what's going to set you apart from other people. And so just like Mallory said, um, I really like how you brought up that it could have been the same person or it could have been, you know, a number of people, but they all had some type of standard that they that they met to keep things consistent and in line with the style of the brand that they want to convey. Good writing is the foundation of good content. We, we kind of hit on that already doesn't matter what medium you're using, that having a good understanding of writing will be extremely important. Good writing is also a mirror of good, clear thinking. I know often, especially when we get up against a deadline, we are writing things out and rarely take time to reread, proofread, or in some instances, delete and rewrite something that we wrote. So when you are out into the, the profession or out in the real world and you're called upon to write something or develop content, be sure you take your time and don't be afraid to rewrite, delete, let your piece rest and revisit it later. Uh, the, the key to a customer centric, intuitive, empathetic point of view. That's a lot of uh, key words right there. Good writing is the key to customer-centric, intuitive, empathetic point of view. What do, you, what do you think they mean by that? It connects to the people you're being. Uh, okay. What else? What it, when we're talking in this context, what does it mean to be empathetic? reading something in the worst possible way, in a way just towards like make sure that like your content is empathetic in the way mm -hmm. that you are being conscious of how like you can offend someone or like mm -hmm. strike someone the wrong way or something and just trying to like see things from a different perspective before you put your content out there. Yeah. And then uh, let's ta tackle customer centric. Why, why is that important? I think that's kind of a little bit more self-explanatory compared to like the rest of them because um, the empathetic one, I think Al did a great job on mm -hmm. explaining it because there's some good points that can go, but the customer-centric is just pretty much what the customers want to see, what people are coming back and seeing from your content, mm -hmm. as well as like the brand that you're actually like prepping for yourself. Like Paula's Coffee, you'll see them posting mainly about their coffee and about their customers, people that come in and off of it, or the building never would you probably see them post about um, you know some ducks you're walking across the pond. Uh, they might. <laughs> so let's take um, uh, let's take like a, a personality, not not a, a business. So who's a personality that you all follow? <laughs> let's 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 take a look at, at yeah. Let's take a look at. Well, let's take a look at co -ops. How is this customer centric? <laughs> is this bad content? No. I, I think it's very subjective. 
subjective, but for like his audience, I think oh. that look at all the likes he has. Like his audience. It goes along with like his music, where they're like, that sounds like something Poe would What say. is he sung? Music. A vibe. Wait, a vibe. So he's selling a vibe. He is he is selling in and telling people like him that it's okay to piss people off. Mm-hmm. It's okay to be unapologetically yourself and screw anybody else that doesn't like it because God sent you to piss off the world. So is he talking about his music? No. no. So sometimes it's okay to talk, talk about the ducks walking across the, the or swimming across the pond when you're when you're selling coffee. If that's the type of vibe that you're. Uh, you know what's funny though is that like right below him you can uh-huh. see or you, like, like the right like right before follow. it was like who follow right after that was like Cody Johnson and he was like talking about God and okay. family. And oh okay. So it's crazy to see like the contrast between yeah. the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's not always about selling like a, a product or trying to stay uh, within the mindset of selling the product. Sometimes you're selling the brand. Uh, you're you're telling people uh, that it's okay to to be themselves or whatever. Um, okay, uh, what intuitive? So we talked about customer centric, empathetic, um, intuitive. What does it mean to be intuitive? You have intuition. Figure it out. So you kind of you know, you know what? Pick up on it. Pick up on what? Like you like need to say the thing. What they're wanting to get from you. Yeah, just like mm-hmm. this kind of co. Everybody wants to go and like read his like this and mm-hmm. be like, gosh, what is he posting today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you think there's ever a point where uh, his Consumer calls on him to maybe change, or something uh, requires him to kind of redirect a little bit. I think that maybe situations I feel like that might happen is like if there's like a huge thing going on in the world, it's like, hey, like now's not the time for this. Maybe okay. now's the time for a more supportive message, and then next week we'll be back on like bullshit. You know? <laughs> yep. I, I think I think that's good. I think also like when relating to music. If you release a either a more cheerful or like more sad album, yeah. you might have to like now try to find that people. So, so whatever comes out with this children's album. That, uh, <laughs> so uh, this this aspect of being intuitive. So um, he is, and I think this is really uh, telling of of his brand. What does his bio say? What does that imply? That he's not grown up yet. That he's not grown up. And so his audience, I think, is a certain, uh, enjoys reveling in adolescence a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so eventually what's going to happen to that audience base? They're going to grow up. And so for him, if he was intuitive, at some point he would realize that his audience base is growing older, and to kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit and to begin thinking about how to rebrand or develop their messages to fit that new audience. So intuition, being intuitive, is kind of looking out and seeing what's on the horizon. His cover photo, his cover photo, Love it. Texas thing I've ever heard. I, it's the best, right? Yeah. So words matter. Uh, your words and what you say and the style, how you say it, are your most cherished and yet undervalued assets. Um, so think about your words being uh, uh, being the uh, not the export, the, uh, being the commodity, uh, and, and that's what you that's what you have. That's what you can sell. Um, always look at some of these self-made. Uh, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok stars, um, they probably didn't have much to begin with other than their words, and they were able to do a lot with them. So 
Words are powerful. You might, yeah, you might, you may not even have those, those uh, that platform around anymore here. Okay, so let's talk about marketing our content. Um, content marketing is building a relationship with your reader by empowering and educating them via content. And so, I think often when we hear things like empowerment. Um, I think our, our minds quickly go to love you like a self-help or trying to, to build you up. But just like we saw from Ko's bio, uh, empowering doesn't necessarily mean some self-help guide. For him it meant, hey, it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to be dumb a little, uh, be dumb sometimes and do stupid stuff. Um, and then when it comes to educating, um, that could be sound a little bit more formal as well, but it doesn't have to be. A marketing technique of creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and acquire a clearly defined audience with the objective of driving profitable customer action. That sounds super technical, but let's take this piece by piece. Um, one of the things that I wanna really point out is in the, the, the list of things that uh, content marketing is, is it's consistency. Why do you think consistency matters when we're producing and, just, and publishing content? You don't think you do, but if a person just sees one of your, this one piece of your content, it'd be the same if they decided to only you don't want one to, you, you know, so are you talking things like from platform to platform? Well, or just say like you have along with like your Facebook post and one per a person just sees one of your Facebook posts. If it is not consistent and they go look at other stuff, like why is it not the same? Or okay. it's not reflecting So what I'm you want. staying on brand, yeah. Okay. I, to me, I feel like the reason consistency is so important, especially like with voice and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is because it's like a relationship. Like whenever right. you meet someone, like whether it's like a friend or even like a sibling or whatever, like you expect someone to be the same way because you go to them for a certain thing. Yes. And so if you never know what you're gonna get when you go to that person, you're not gonna have a relationship with them because it's unreliable. Yeah. And I feel like you can kind of think that with like a content creator too, where it's like the reason I follow you is because I go to you for this, and I know that you always give me this. Yes. What is the uh, formula for a typical sitcom? What's a sitcom? Oh, 30 minutes. What does sitcom stand for? Sit situational and comedy. Yeah, situational like, comedy. Like and so what is the formula that we use for situational comedy sitcoms on TV? Uh, like, like a problem. Uh -huh. And then I like the solution. Okay. <laughs> so let's take Friends, for example, right? So we have an exhibition period where everyone comes together. And then like Mallory said, there's a problem. Problem occurs. And then what? Usually people freak out. And funny. Yeah, so things escalate, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And then we hit the apex of the problem. Yeah. And then what happens? Solution. We have the solution. And then we digress back down to a baseline, and then what happens after that? We settle into the new normal. That is the uh, formula that we've used in sitcoms for decades. Why hasn't it changed? Because it works. Because we expect a certain thing from sitcoms, and that's why we go back to them over and over and over. Right? Like that's what we expect. You what? That's why you watch The Office for a few times. Right, we know exactly what's, we know the formula of what's gonna happen, but we don't necessarily know the events that's gonna take place. Same thing with Friends, same thing with, with any, uh, with, you know, King of the Hill, or those, those types of things. Especially with the horror movies, and I know some of the people like actually dislike them now, mm -hmm. they used to always have like a result ending. Right. And I feel like nowadays, what happens when you watch a movie and you don't get the resolve of You walk out of the, the theater thinking what? Oh, yeah. What a waste of time. 
but to what? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so what about? Did anyone watch? Um, uh, who's the guy that was on Titanic? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And he was in that one movie with with when they did the dreams. Inception. Oh, with the tall. Oh my it's gosh, did you watch Inception? Oh, with the yeah. It's, it's, oh, that was so, awful. So what about, um, did anyone watch uh, Midsummer? Um, oh no, I heard that was crazy. No. <laughs> well, that might be a reason why not a lot of people watched it. <laughs> so the endings never provided that result. And there were no sequels. And so we, we, we never got to, we, we, it was left to our imagination to whether things went the way that we wanted them to go or not. And we don't like that. <laughs> Critics might like it, audiences really don't like that. Especially not in the the midst of it being in theaters. Like afterwards, yeah, people might sit back and watch it, they may evaluate it a little more, but that, that's not that doesn't play into what we want in this time. The other aspect of consistency is how is the, uh, the how often you post things. And so you have to stick to a schedule. Um, like some of the, the YouTube things I watch, um, I know one of them posts on Sunday. Or they actually both post on Sunday, the, the two that I'm pretty uh, tied to. One of them got off schedule and now posts on Tuesday, and I hate it so much because <laughs> that was my schedule is, you know, wake up on Monday, and first thing I yeah. do is watch. I don't like when, when YouTubers don't post what they say they will, or they like, sure, or they go on um, like vacation or something, and you know that they, mm -hmm. um, Scheduled them, and so either they get off on the schedule or it's the same content over. And you're like they've scheduled this, and it's like, mm. yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, I think we should be. So we talked about like distributing, like being consistent, um, having uh, relevant, valuable, uh, and attractive content. The next part is uh, the clearly defined audience. Why do we spend so much time making you think about your target audience when we begin thinking about messages? It kind of gives you a direction too. Like mm -hmm. it really does, it is helpful for you. Just like with post stuff, like he knows his audience and that's yes. why he feels comfortable being like, God made me to piss people off because his audience is not like 60 year old women who are empty nesters who are like trying to find something to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's not, it will not benefit you fiscally or uh, make the most of your time to have a broad target audience because you're going to waste time and money trying to reach people that don't want to be reached by you and don't want to consume your materials. So it may seem like you're leaving out a large audience if you target in and hone in too much on your, your audience, but it'll save you time, it'll save you money, it'll be worth it. Uh, okay, why is content marketing effective? Um, we're seeing people tune out traditional forms of marketing. What is a traditional form of marketing? Commercial. And how do we tune them out? Fast forwarding recorded shows. So we have DVR. So we're watching TV. We have DVR. We can fast forward through them unless we're watching live TV. Live TV. Yeah. What else? You want to have Hulu, mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. you can pay a premium to not watch commercials, uh, or you can purchase the episodes or watch them on Netflix, right? Or Amazon. So we're able to uh, totally block out some of those traditional marketing, uh, traditional marketing content. Uh, what's so because of that? What do we turn to? Well, let's let's take another a forced. The moment where we're forced to watch commercials. So, what about like uh, if you're playing uh, a game on your phone, and we're presented with certain ads that we have to watch before we can sit out of them, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 What do you do? You look for that little red or that little. You wait for the X, or you just play the game. Yeah. yeah. So you just put the phone down. <laughs> you, yeah. Or you just swipe up and go and do something else. Or, or like ads on Facebook when you're watching a video, and they mm -hmm. like, I don't know if it's. The creator that puts the ads in it, or if it's an AI, but it's always the, like the climax of the video, like reveal yes. this, and it's like ad yeah. or something really stupid. Yeah. But you know what's weird though is mm -hmm. that so my stepdad and my mom came down not too long ago. Yeah. And 
the kids just want to watch TV, they only mm -hmm. have cable back home, and so they can't even watch like Netflix and Hulu yeah. and kind of thing. They were kind of like worse, like not worse than commercials, but like worse than commercials and like where how come I can't like flip through or like flip through the channel? It was crazy how she. It's kind of shocked. Yeah, my parents, yeah, my parents tried CCTV and they didn't like. Yeah. They, like it's not like the standard form of TV. And I'm like, we're used to something that. Yeah. You know, like something different than what I do. But they didn't like it. It's weird. So now, what is? What do we turn to? How do we market products now? Influencers. Influencers, which do what? Make. You say videos? Or through social media, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Post on social media, and what do they do? You pay them, and then they either like review it or just say to go buy it or sure. whatever. Do you, what do you think is more effective than reviewing it in the midst of or sandwiched between two crappy products or just saying, hey, this is great, go buy it? Why? So more trustworthy, right? They they were willing to say that these two products are crappy, but oh, whoa, this product's actually really good. I also like when they do say like it's sponsored and like they make a like right. they say it is sponsored, so I know because most of the people that I watch like if they're gonna if they're gonna get if they accept that mm -hmm. sponsorship, then they actually will use the product. It's not just right. them getting money from it. So or that they at least make it seem like yeah. Well. Um, okay, do y'all remember the the music festival, uh, Fire Music Festival? Uh, <laughs> well, so there's this music festival created by this, um, He's like a just some kid, really. He was, he was fairly young, right? Yeah. So he sold really expensive tickets. People who didn't have a lot of money uh, spent their savings on tickets to go to this island and have this really unique uh, music festival experience. Um, he had a lot of investors, and when people showed up, nothing was as they promised. It was, it was really a, a disaster. It was in the Bahamas. That's just some random island in the Caribbean somewhere. So, Kylie, no, one of the. Uh, Kendall? One of, no, one of the other ones. One of the Kardashians was actually paid like two million, one and a half million dollars. For one Instagram post promoting the fire of music. I was telling that like why just pay like a for one post. Some post. Yeah. Um, so that was another form of marketing. It's not necessarily commercial. You have an influencer. You pay them money, and then they there's a there's a documentary on about music. That's on Netflix. Yeah. There's a, there's actually a couple of them. It's really interesting. Um, so we're moving away from traditional marketing. Uh, people love looking at content. We spend hours on TikTok. We spend hours on Instagram. We spend some time on Snapchat going through some of the, the, uh, the stories that are on there. Um, potential customers are very accessible in those forms because we're, we're out there. We're spending time on those. Uh, we're not necessarily looking at and critically evaluating the content for, is this a piece of marketing? Are they trying to sell me something? We're kind of lost in the story of it all. It's very cost effective. Uh, creating content can take time. That's the only cost. Uh, but in terms of, uh, even if you're gonna be willing to pay for, um, uh, for, pay for Facebook or Instagram to boost the post, or if you're gonna pay for advertising on Twitter, uh, it still doesn't cost a whole lot, where commercials can cost thousands of dollars. In some instances, like during the Super Bowl, they can cost millions of dollars. So it's extremely cost effective for how uh, well it works. Content, no. Sorry, this is just like a little fun fact. Yeah. Uh, for the campaign, like mm -hmm. the Josh Weingartner, all that. Oh, yeah. So one of my friends, she is like, so she works for TCSA, uh -huh. and so she's been helping with the campaign. And she said in the past two weeks, just for Josh Weingartner's campaign, mm -hmm. they spent two million dollars. They're yeah. playing it all big right now because yeah. the the voting main voting is tomorrow. And yeah, I just I thought that was crazy. Like especially like because you think about like around here, you're like, oh, it probably won't be as much. I can't imagine how much they spent for like yeah. presidential. Um, so I, and I don't know if y'all pay pay attention, but. Uh, 
when we turn on our local news, uh, we don't see just a whole lot of uh, political ads. But when you do see a political ad, to me it's like, yeah, it's shocking. When you go to swing states, uh, that is all you see. Because here, and we're, we're starting, we're, you know, we're, I think the numbers appear that we're moving towards the other end of the spectrum, but for years we weren't. And so does it make sense to spend a lot of money trying to promote a, a Democratic candidate here? No. But when you go to Minnesota or Iowa or Florida, that's where you spend most of your marketing budget, right? Because it could go either way. Yeah. Why do you think so much money is being spent now with these two candidates in this region? Because elections are up. And we, yeah. Well, it's because Ronnie Jackson is and Bill Schlagbarger. Ronnie Jackson is supported by the president, which makes him really uh, appealing to what type of people? The base, Trump, Trump base, Trump supporters, his base, right? Uh, and then we, we can have more moderate, conser uh, more moderate Republican or, or conservatives, but. Who is Josh Weingartner's base? That is easy to determine. People that live in Canyon. Like ag people. So sure, ag people. We know he has an ag background. We know Ronnie doesn't. What, why in why in some people's minds are they hopping on the Ronnie Jackson bandwagon when he doesn't even live here? He's not even from here. Because if, if they support him, they support the president. So that's his base. Okay. And so. What do y'all, do y'all think that that base is big enough for him to win in this area? The base is here, but I don't know if the base would switch from like the local guy to, it's out of the interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I. And so when, when you say things like it's gonna be interesting, what does that mean for the campaign? You gotta do the most. stressful for them probably. You gotta, you gotta spin, spin, spin. You gotta try to get as much, your name out there as much as possible. Uh, okay, so today, content marketing, uh, the, the digital era, the access to internet, uh, or the widespread access to internet really has uh, revolutionized the way that we can market content. That, that has resulted in lowered costs. <coughs> it has removed a lot of barriers. Um, what, it, what does that mean? Remove so barriers. Anybody can content or advertise and make content. Which this was the first question? Everyone. Anybody. Anybody can do it. And so that's why we see these influencers have really risen because they can take their words, make it mean something, and uh, be successful. Um, also easier to search and find the information that you're looking for. Uh, this is another key thing to remember that when we're out on the internet, when we're out on social media, we are looking for something. And so you always need to keep that, that in mind that the consumer, the user, whatever it is, is a predator. They're on the prowl for something. They will not exert more energy unless they know they can find it, unless they know they can capture that prey. So let's uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll meet back here. We'll wrap this up and then we're gonna talk about Adobe Spark. Cool.